Hello everyone and welcome to the low level array lecture. Um, in this lecture we're going to be going over um, basically how computers store information on a low level. So we'll focus on computer memory, how we have memory addresses, so how a computer can actually keep track of where information is stored. We'll have units of memory such as bits and bytes and learning how memory is retrieved. So just a quick note the next few slides are a little text heavy, but as we continue on, we'll see more and more picture examples of what we're actually talking about. So let's go ahead and continue. So in order to accurately describe the way Python represents the sequence types, we're going to have to learn about this low level computer architecture. So the primary memory of a computer is composed of bits of information. And those bits, they're typically grouped into larger units that depend on usually the precise system architecture, but a typical unit is a byte, which is equivalent to eight bits. And so a computer system will have a huge number of bytes in memory. And to keep track of what information is stored in what byte, the computer uses an abstraction known as a memory address. And in effect, each byte of memory is associated with a unique number that serves as its address. So for instance, you might have byte number 2144 versus byte number 2147. And in that way the computer system can refer to the data and the memory addresses are typically coordinated with the physical layout of the memory system. So let's go ahead and see kind of a drawing example of that. So this is usually how we represent um, a low-level computer memory. It's individual bytes with consecutive addresses. Okay, so despite the, sequ the sequential nature of the numbering system, whoops, the computer hardware is designed in theory so that any byte of the main memory can be efficiently accessed based upon its memory address. So in this sense, we can say that a computer's main memory performs as a random access memory, RAM. And that is to say, it's just as easy to retrieve, let's say, byte number 8675309 as it is to retrieve byte number 309. So each individual byte of memory can be stored or retrieved in order one time, so in constant time. And in general, a programming language keeps track of the association between an identifier and the memory address in which the associated value is stored. So you, for example, might have an identifier X might be associated with one value stored in memory, while Y is associated with another value stored in memory. And a common programming task is to keep track of a sequence of related objects. For example, if you're making a video game and you want to keep track of the top 10 scores for that game, rather than use 10 different variables for that task, you would prefer to use a single name for the group and then use index numbers to refer to each of those high scores within that group. Okay, on to the next slide. So a group of related variables can be stored one after another in a contiguous portion of the computer's memory and we can denote that representation as an array. So that's what we're really talking about. So let's go ahead and see a more tangible example, such as a text string stored as an ordered sequence of individual characters. And something to note here is that Python internally represents each Unicode character with 16 bits, or two bytes for each character. So when we actually um, diagram it out, it looks like this. So here we have our bits. 16 of them, and since each Unicode character with 16 bits um, needs a two bytes for the character, if we have a sample string, so we have a six character string here, such as sample, it would be stored in 12 consecutive bytes of memory. Since each Unicode character is taking two bytes, or 16 bits, since two times eight is 16. Okay. So, what's up next? Just some basic terminology. We have an array here of six characters, and each location within the array we can call a cell. And the integer index can be used to describe its location. So for example, in this figure, the cell of the array of index four has the contents L, and it's stored in bytes 2154 and 2155 of memory. So something that's important to know is that each cell of an array must use the same number of bytes. 
And it's this requirement is what allows an arbitrary cell of the array, or any randomly chosen cell, or any randomly accessed cell of the array, to be accessed in constant time based on its index. So in particular, if we know the memory address at which an array starts, and the number of bytes per element, so in this case two for a Unicode character, and the desired index within the array, then the appropriate memory address can be computed using something like start plus the cell size times the index. So by this formula, since the cell at index 0 begins precisely at the start of the array, the cell at index 1 begins precisely uh, cell size bytes beyond the start of the array and so on. So in order to flesh that a little more of some numbers, the cell of, in this figure, cell 4, begins at memory location 2146 plus 2 times 4, which is 2146 plus 8, which is 2154. And we can see here that indeed the letter, the letter L begins at 2154. So I got that by just saying our start is 2146, and I'm adding the cell size, which is 2 in this case, we're using 2 bytes per unit code character and times 4, which is the index I want to achieve, or access, excuse me. And that's going to be 2146 times 2 plus 2 times 4, which is 8. So 2146 plus 8 brings us to 2154, and that's how I can access um, index 4 there, or the letter L. So that's the low-level thinking. But usually we're thinking on a higher-level abstraction, and basic abstraction is what we're really going to use for real-world discussions. Um, when we're discussing the interview problems, we really won't be talking about those bits and bytes. We'll be talking about real-world real world abstraction levels, this higher level where we just say, we have this sample string here, and the indexes are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. We won't be worrying about cell size or bytes per element. Okay. So moving along, the last topic for this lecture is going to be a referential array and how arrays um, can use object references. So this is a pretty important topic and it's going to seem maybe a little confusing at first, but at the end we're going to drive it home with a bunch of examples and it should be pretty clear to you what the array is doing by referencing. So let's imagine we have an example. We have 100 student names with associated ID numbers. So we have a student name, let's say Renee, another student named Joseph, we have Janet, Jonas, Helen, and Virginia, and each of those students has an ID number with them, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we might be considering using an array-based structure to maintain the names of the students um, currently assigned to the ID numbers. So in Python, we would just use a list of names in brackets. And we want to represent this list with an array. But remember, we must adhere to the requirement that each cell of the array uses the same number of bytes. And yet the elements are strings, and strings naturally have different lengths. So we could attempt to reserve enough space for each cell to hold the maximum length string, not just of currently stored strings, but of any string we might ever want to store. So um, a maximum length of any possible name, no matter how long their name is. But that would actually be kind of wasteful. We'd be using a lot of space um, almost preemptively in case a name popped up. So in our last example, we saw the word uh, sample used. But in this case, we'd have to kind of set aside bytes of information for names that we don't know how long they're going to be. So instead of doing that, what we're going to do is make an array and um, use object references. So let's go ahead and see a diagram of what that looks like. So here we can see that each element is a reference to the object. So we have index 0 referencing the object, that's string Renee. And um, we have a list now of names where the index is referencing an object. So although the relative size of the individual elements may vary, the number of bits used to store the memory address of each element is fixed. And in this way, Python can support that constant time access, that order one, um, to a list or tuple element based on its index. So in this figure, um, we characterize this list of strings that are names of the students. 
And it's more likely that we would be able to manage this using that list of references. Okay, so let's go ahead and see some more examples of referencing objects to the list. So this idea that lists and tuples are essentially referential structures is pretty significant to the semantics of these objects classes. So a single list instance may include multiple references to the same objects as elements of the list. And it's possible for a single object to be an element of two or more lists. And we'll see what that looks like in a diagram in just a second. So we can have two lists simply store references back to the same object. So an example of this is maybe when you're slicing a list, the result looks like a new list instance, but that new list actually has references to the same elements that are in the original list. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like. So here we've computed the slice of a list here on the bottom I have a list called primes and it's just the prime numbers. Notice how each of these indexes, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 7, is referencing some prime integer. And then if we say temp, some new list, equals primes 3 through 6, this new temp list, this temporary list, is referencing the same elements here, or the same objects. So we're not actually creating new objects. We're just referencing them when we do this slice of the list. Okay, so what if we do some sort of maybe a reassignment? So in this case, when the elements of the list are immutable objects, and since integers are immutable, um, the fact that the two lists share elements isn't really significant, as neither of the lists can cause a change to the shared object. So if, for example, I said temp of 2 is equal to 15, so here I say temp of 2 is equal to 15. What I'm actually doing is just changing the existing reference here. So I'm not changing the actual integer object. So I didn't change 13. I just pointed to the, the index 2 on the temp list to another object. Okay. And so the same type of semantics here are demonstrated when you're making a new list as a copy of an existing one. So if you're using a syntax, such as what I have here in bold, maybe you make a list, um, you have a new list that you're, that you're calling backup, and you set it equal to list of primes. What you're actually doing is just producing a new list that's a shallow copy, in that it references all the same elements as in the first list. You're not actually duplicating um, those original objects, you're just duplicating a list that references those same objects. Okay, and if you wanted the contents of the list, maybe like they were immutable type, so you were referencing um, a list to a list, you could make what's called the deep copy, meaning a new list with new elements, and that can be produced by using the deep copy function from the copy module in Python. Main takeaway here is that if you were to make a new list in a normal manner, you would just be, be making a shallow copy, and that it's referencing the same elements as the first list. So in order to really show this, we'll kind of do a more extreme example. So a lot of times in Python, and I just added an asterisk notation here, so a lot of times in Python you'll see um, a list initiated like this. You'll have an element zero and then say times eight. So what that's actually doing is you're saying all eight cells um, reference the same object. So if you have your list here counters, each of these cells is a reference to the same object. You're not actually making eight um, integer objects. You're referencing them all to the same uh, zero number there. So at a first glance, you may think this is a little alarming, but what we rely on is the fact that that referenced integer is immutable. So even if you have a command such as taking counters index two and adding one to it, something like this. So we say counters two plus equals one. Um, that does not technically change that value of the existing integer instance. What it does, it just computes a new integer with value zero plus one, and then sets cell number two uh, to reference that newly com computed value. And then the resulting configuration looks like what we have here in this drawing. So really a takeaway here is how 
each of these uh, index or indices in the cells and in the list is actually just referencing some object. And depending on how we make our copies, we could just be making a copy of those references, not of the objects themselves. Okay, so last diagram example I want to show you is if you're doing something such as extend. Um, the extend command is used to add all elements from one list to the end of another. Uh, but you should note that the extended list does not receive copies of those elements. Instead, what it's, re it's receiving the references to those elements. And so here we have a diagram kind of portraying that effect. So if I were to say this list primes, remember it was that list from the beginning, we have indexes 0 through 7, and numbers the prime numbers 2 through 19. If I extend it with, let's say, another list that's three elements long, extras, um, what I'm actually doing is I'm just adding the references to the sec to the first list here, the primes list. And that's really the main takeaway, that I'm adding references. Each of these cells is really a reference to an object, and I can have multiple lists um, with multiple cells all referencing the same object. Okay. So just to review what we've gone over in this section, we went over a very basic computer architecture low-level thinking of low-level array representation and how bits and bytes can be used in order to have constant time or order one um, access to any random element in the array. And then we learned about how arrays are able to be referential and use referencing in order for each cell or index to reference an object in an array. All right. So I know we did um, quite a bit here and we went over quite a bit. What we're going to do next is learn about dynamic arrays. Now, as far as how this information applies to the interview practice problems, really the main takeaway from a practical perspective is that idea of referencing. So if you want to play around with the more practical perspective of this lecture, go ahead and make a couple of lists, um, use extend and use append, and then use slices. Maybe try to edit some of the um, objects that the list indexes or indices are referencing. And make sure you really understand that if you make a change on one list, um, the other reference on the other list may or may not get affected depending on how you code it out. Okay, so that's really where the practical use case comes in here, that idea of referencing and how slices um, kind of carry over that reference or how the extend method would also carry over that reference and that you're not actually, in a sense, duplicating or creating um, new objects. You're just referencing the old ones. All right. Thanks. I know that was kind of a heavy lecture and pretty theoretical, but overall it's important to know, um, especially from a practical perspective, that idea of referencing. All right. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture where we're going to be discussing dynamic arrays.